Well, welcome back. Today I have Locke Kelly with me. Locke is a meditation teacher, a psychotherapist, and founder of the Effortless Mindfulness Institute. He also hosts the podcast Effortless Mindfulness. He's the author of two books, Shift into Freedom and The Way of Effortless Mindfulness. And most recently, Locke has created a meditation app called the Mindful Glimpse app, which is available now in the App Store. And on a personal level, Locke is one of the most playful, kind, and open-hearted people I have ever come across. I consider him an architect of mind and a true warrior of love. He really embodies what he teaches. So thank you, Locke, for joining me today and sharing your love and wisdom with my listeners. Thank you, John. Great to connect with you again and so happy to be here to share some experiential ways uh, that I hope people can get a taste of what's possible. Great. Well, why don't we begin by, um, if you don't mind, just offering us a brief intellectual, spiritual history. Sure. So as you said, you know, currently I'm uh, offering these mindful glimpses in the form of an app and some books and website and other ways to share it. And so the reason I'm sharing it is because early on in life, I started to have these glimpses. At first, I didn't call them those, uh, peak experiences, sometimes people call them. And when I f ask people, they often are shy about it or don't recognize, but uh, some openings in childhood and, you know, even during sports, one of them happened where I felt I had kind of dropped into my body, opened up my awareness and felt interconnected with everyone and everything and felt optimally functioning and joyous time was <laughs> relative and I was in the now, everything slowed down. And I explained this to one of my friends who asked and he just kind of looked at me and went, oh, cool. But one of the seniors on this team I was on threw me a book um, when I was 15 years old, it said, here, kid, read this. And it was Zen and the Art of Archery, which was one of the first mm. kind of books translated. So I was like, wow, people value this and it's related to, <laughs> to you know, everyday consciousness. It's not just religion, it's some, but it's something that this feeling isn't just you know, in the zone or being in the flow state, it literally is something you can live from. So that immediately piqued my interest and that led me to explore by, I did TM when I was, you know, 16 and then- uh, Transcendental meditation. Yeah, tra transcendental meditation. And then in college <clears throat> had a couple of losses within a year, which is also important because this effortless mindfulness that I teach isn't just meditation, it's a healing kind of bringing ancient wisdom, contemplative traditions together with contemporary neuroscience and psychology, particularly psychotherapy. So I had, uh, my father had died of cancer that year. And then my best friend died in a, from the ice hockey team that I was playing on died in a car accident. And then my grandmother who had been living with us died of old age also at the end of that year. And I was coming out of uh, the library late at night in a kind of cold winter night and <clears throat> was walking by myself and just heard this voice within me say, I don't know if you can take this much longer because I had felt this just this weight of the depression. I couldn't find other peers who had gone through this at that age. I was a sophomore in college. So somehow hearing that, I kind of looked up as if as if this, this part of me or this voice was, was talking to me. And as I looked up, my awareness opened up into the night sky. <clears throat> and I felt like I connected and relaxed something dropped and was kind of unburdened and something 
was received and <laughs> some dimension was interconnected in a moment that I felt like me again and the you know the the physical emotional mental depression was there as kind of um you know one fat level of the fabric of my experience but that there was this subtler deeper wider higher <laughs> consciousness that was more essential that wasn't escaping it but actually gave me comfort and love it felt very mm. loving and it felt like i was love and i felt and i started crying and laughing and it was literally then i i i remember as i continued walking i was like okay i'm here at college now what am i going to do with my life i can do anything i i want you know this is the gift my father gave me to you know a college education he's passed on he did what he did with his life based on but i can do anything i think i'll you know find out what this is all about mm. and so and so i did and that led me to graduate school to going to sri lanka india and nepal to studying with different um, so you got a master in divinity correct from cambridge yeah master uh, master divinity uh from and uh, and uh, also a clinical social work degree, a kind of a joint degree from Columbia University and Columbia. Uh, Union Theological. Um, <clears throat> so, so I went on a fellowship to India, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. I did classical mindfulness, insight, meditation, vipassana. Then went up, ended up with a teacher of Tibetan teacher Zogchen Mahamudra, who gave me this kind of uh, or group of us this what's called pointing out instruction, which is kind of an immediate shift, small pointing of awareness, which is gave me a glimpse, which is why I call it glimpse. And within that three minute practice, I felt the same way I did at the end of a 10 day meditation retreat, except my eyes were open. I felt much more embodied and kind of joyous and free, similar to that early experiences. And so uh, again, I thought, oh, no, there's a way to do it. Let me learn how to do it. And then let me learn how to share it with others. Right. So my listeners will be more familiar with the Theravada, kind of the Vipassana approach. Yeah. So I'd love to get into uh, more of these non-dual approaches. Mm -hmm. But I want to back up a little bit you mentioned that you had three deaths mm. early on in your adult life and that that had a real impact. More and more, I find that framing my spiritual practice under that framework of death mm. is becoming more profound, more uh, useful in navigating my daily life. I think I mentioned to you at your retreat at Blue Spirit in Costa Rica, that for 2023, I made the commitment to meet death every day, mm -hmm. not in a morbid sense, but mm -hmm. to gain some clarity. And, you know, at first, a lot of the reflections I was receiving, you know, kind of imagining myself on my deathbed, looking back at my life, I was really focused on how I was showing up in relationship. You know, was I truly there for my kids when they're in front of me, excited to share something with me? Was I fully present? Um, you know, did I let go of that trivial fight with my partner? Um, and then as, you know, the months went on, the reflection became more and more continuous or momentary it was oh wait okay what in this moment is mm. staying still what's stable what can i grasp what can i hold on to and so the practice became letting go in each moment it was recognizing this truth of impermanence and that really has opened up some space for me, uh, allowed me to kind of 
relax some fears and anxieties and the need to control situations and have my expectations met. Anyway, and I, I find that a lot of people that come to uh, spiritual practice often are met with a trial like a father, or spouse, or child that has died. Um, so anyway, interesting that it seems yeah. that really launched you into uh, spiritual practice as well, of course, with um, some other experiences. But Okay, so you went to Sri Lanka on a fellowship. You yeah. studied Vipassana there mm -hmm. and sat retreat for yeah. uh, how long? Well, <clears throat> I did, you know, three 10-day, two 21-day bunch of five day and studied at the university and also <clears throat> once a week when in, in between retreats I would go down the hill with the meditation teacher in Kandy Sri Lanka uh, to the morgue <laughs> because this mm. is one of the classical uh, Vipassana practices is to contemplate death right and um, you know so so that was you know the the meditation on impermanence. And, you know, certainly I had, you know, good training, good, good um, meeting of um, at that young age in my 20s, you know, kind of uh, as much as I, I could realize that what it took me into at first was kind of a, you know, fear would come up. I'd have to, you know, fear of death and feeling of loss and sometimes even trembling and then as you said, you know, kind of going through the moment into the now and mm -hmm. finding this eternal now that doesn't come and go, that can't be hurt, that is uh, essentially okay and feels this essential well-being. And then the, the non-dual part of that is that it is not separate from this impermanent and kind of uh, precious but vulnerable human body that could go and die any time, um, and yet, what a miracle! What a an amazing uh, opportunity to take the next breath and to show up and to start to see which part is the fear, which part is the drives of you know the classic, you know greed hatred and delusion or grasping and and uh, pushing away and 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 let the human body have its have its due that it gets sad it gets fearful and recognize who or what is aware of it and not from a distant witness but right from within and all around in a way that uh, there was a kind of a mixing of the ultimate reality that is always okay and well and can't be hurt and the relative reality that gets hurt that feels all natural human emotions and it's not that they go away or that thoughts go away but that it's a matter of who or what they arise to that changes right yeah with the theravada tradition i do see a potential pitfall because as you begin practice, you're starting from this dualistic mind. There's the meditator mm -hmm. and then the object of meditation. And of course, I think that there's utility in learning mm -hmm. to develop things like concentration, equanimity. But yes, there is this, uh, as you move through kind of these progressive stages, you tend to emphasize the emptiness side of things. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost that you disconnect yourself from the precious human heart. Mm -hmm. um, now, in the non-dual traditions, uh, there's this word I, that you've brought up several times and I think this comes from Mahamudra, but the same taste, is it Dharmakaya, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I, I think really captures 
this what what you just tried to express kind mm-hmm. of getting two sides of the same coin do you yeah. want to ex- expand on that a bit sure yeah <clears throat> yeah there's either the three kayas they talk about dharma kai which is pure awareness then samboga kai which is kind of the mm. changing contents of consciousness and then nirmana kai which is the way the that you live in the relative world from mm. <clears throat> from wherever you're living so but the same taste is the you know like i would say that in some ways that in vipassana the insight is insight into who you're not into the emptiness into the no self into the change right. and that the insight in the more effortless mahamudra zokshan is insight into who you are so that when mm-hmm. the you deconstruct the current one you thought you were <laughs> then you, the the transition is no self but that if you don't find out where you're aware from, that's not the small ego self, then you're left in this either robotic or detached, disembodied um, right. consciousness. So the pointing of the kind of the unfolding of the tradition of mindfulness uh, from Theravada to Mahayana to Dzogchen Mahamudra is uh, to like curiously recognize well, w- what is aware and can I rest as this which is aware, which is not a thing, which is empty and yet awake. So that empty awakeness, um, some people can spiritually bypass and there are certain non-dual traditions that you that say, oh, I'm only the awareness, everything else is illusion. So if you stop, stop at no self and then you can stop at pure awareness but the buddhist non-dual version is that the requires that you have at least a glimpse or taste of that which doesn't come and go of that which is empty but awake and where you're aware from and then the question is what's its relationship from that ultimate to the relative so what's the experience or what's called you know dependent arising or co co rising wisdom which is that the awareness and the aliveness are not separate they're simultaneously or uh interconnected uh more like an ocean and wave ocean of awareness that's right. arising as a wave of your body thoughts feeling sensations and you feel this kind of interconnection and a ground of the ground is now in awareness and aliveness and not in thought or small self or in a meditative uh, witness that's detached. It's now, right. it, and that, you know, that's kind of an unusual premise, um, although many people know it from f- more of a external flow flow state or what what you do when when you have free time you do what you love and you go into this consciousness where your ego relaxes you feel interconnected with everything you're optimally doing the thing you love whether it's a sport or walking in nature or playing, playing with an instrument a dog or, playing an yeah. instrument right anything like that so there is this this pointing to its natural quality Right. So you've kind of laid the premise for us. Do you mind walking us through one of your glimpses to give us a more experiential understanding of what we're uh, talking about here? Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll hopefully do a couple of them, but this one, so often some people like to go in, like the awareness is within others go out to come back in. If you go in, you have to open up to come back. So this one, we're going to go out and come back in. So this is done by an inquiry. And so I'll just set this up with a little summary of what I just said, which is that there, the current operating system, which Vipassana and insight meditation consider this small self center or ego center or thought-based self-referencing 
way of orienting our me, who's me, if that is a part of us and can just relax. And if the premise is there is an awake consciousness that's here when that relaxes, that, that it's not either uh, I am smart and fast thinking and scanning for danger, or I'm in this empty, detached meditative state, but there's actually an awake, aware, embodied, responsive consciousness that isn't thought-based. So that's the, the premise uh, that makes this direct path different, that we're going right to the solution. We're going to let the problem relax, and we're going to go see if the solution, meaning the awake consciousness, is already possibly aware, even for a minute or two. And the key is that you can't go back to thought to check whether you're there, that you're actually coming into this kind of more intuitive, optimal knowing like you do when you're in a flow state that you don't have to think about thinking. You're just awake and here. So that's the that's the premise. So it gives you the the you have to have the little map. So that's a little map. And so the <laughs> this actual first glimpse practice is an inquiry uh, that's a lot simpler than the explanation. <laughs> so here's how it goes. So just consider understand with your mind and then look with awareness what's here now when there's no problem to solve. So just understanding the words with your mind and then letting that mind, the problem solver that understands the words, relax and let awareness feel what's aware, what's here, just now, when there's no problem to solve. And then, as you're aware of this awareness that's here, what's it like to rest as this awareness? And then speaking to the awareness, when you rest as this awareness, what's the relationship to vibration, sensation, thoughts, your body, and the room? So what's it like to be alert without orienting by thought? So you could move your hand from here, or you could use thought, but you don't have to check with thought to be awake and embodied and responsive and notice the qualities that are naturally here. What's absent is maybe even easiest And then what are the positive qualities that seem to naturally arise as the constriction relaxes and the presence is invited from the background to the foreground? So just notice the tendency to go to thought to check, but just... Notice who or what is aware of that checking. Checking can happen, but where are you aware from that doesn't have to check, that's effortlessly mindful? So this is the effortless mindfulness. It's not that it takes no effort, but when you discover it, you recognize, oh, the mind is checking, but uh, there's. A, let me find the awareness that's already aware without my help. And then, as I rest as this, I can 
Think of my phone number. And then let it go into peace of mind. That is alert, not sleepy, not spaced out, but definitely new, may have a new feeling. So there's kind of a, like riding a bicycle, you're kind of like, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> shouldn't I be thinking? It doesn't feel the same. Some people it's immediately like, oh, good, relief. Others it takes a little, the parts or the protectors or the thinking mind collapses us. But if you just, anytime you're collapsed or part takes over, you just allow that to happen without judging and just find out where you're aware from. That's aware of this part of you that is allowed to think, worry, <laughs> can be fearful, but the mixing of the awareness that's not fearful, not worried, with any part of you that is having a human experience. And then there's a kind of open-heartedness and open-mindedness that feels like you're, the center of you is dropped down so it no longer has to be in your, behind your eyes, but almost down into your heart space or into your whole body as the wave that's arising from this ocean of awareness. So that's that's kind of a, a short glimpse or pointer, you know, right to, usually they'll, you know, if, if it's an evening or a weekend or a, or my app, there's all sorts of intro and setup and preparation, but just notice that even if it was for one second, three seconds, one minute, this feeling, just notice whether you felt this before, whether you would call it peace or whether it's awake and alert. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really love the prompt. What's well, here now when there's no problem to solve it yeah. really just cuts away that problem solver and opens yeah. up this tremendous vast space. Mm. It's almost like you fall through the floor mm. and then yeah. uh, realize, oh, it's, it's okay because there's no ground. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, and, the, and just to say that, uh, that the mind, to the mind, <laughs> that, that it's not, it's, this isn't about escaping problems, it's actually upgrading the problem solver. So it's literally about letting the old problem solver that is, you know, creating problems about the problem <laughs> to relax that becomes neurotic. And then yeah. once you're in this awake, then you can meet life and solve everyday problems. Yeah. Yeah, that brings up another point I wanted to mention. In that glimpse, you mentioned parts. And mm. as a part of your work, you've integrated the internal family systems model. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to speak to that a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I personally have found it tremendously useful. And in meditation, often the ego gets a bad rap. But like you said, right. it's not like we step away from all our problems. We still right. have the day to meet our life, our problems. And it is more of an upgraded problem solver that allows space for this thinker and other parts of us. Yeah. But it navigates our daily lives with a little more discerning wisdom. Yeah. So the IFS is one type of what's called parts, parts work or parts based therapies that have a history from Gestalt to psychosynthesis to voice dialogue. And it's a more <clears throat> contemporary version that has a very elegant system of describing the way that thoughts, feelings, sensations, and worldview come together. <clears throat> so when you sit in meditation, for those who have sat and uh, calm the body and mind and then do 
a kind of mindfulness of <clears throat> thoughts, feelings, sensations, you can see that the small self is made of changing thoughts. So you can go from a sense of <clears throat> solid self to deconstructing it to uh, a Nietzsche or change or no self. And then uh, whether you go to awake awareness in effortless mindfulness or you stay in the mindful witness, either way, you're going to have to come back as soon as you get off the cushion and walk around. And when you walk around, you can't remain either in pure awareness or in a mindful witness that's detached and somebody saying something to you. How do you, you know, what, weren't you going to give me that report? Oh, that's just a thought. And there's, <laughs> they're treating me like I'm a solid person. But I'll just respond <laughs> with words, you know. So, so, so what happens is thoughts, right. feelings, sensations, and the the role or the persona is such an important uh, central experience for us in the world. So, is it that now we're by being in that persona or feeling? negative negative emotion that we're no longer awake or we're no longer meditating or we're not mindful? Or can we uh, accept those emotions as patterns? So in Vipassana, they're called sometimes kleshas or skandhas or mind objects in the foundations of mindfulness. But this is saying that uh, even something like the small self, which we call an ego or an ego manager, that once we recognize, oh, we're more the awake consciousness, some systems then say, oh, then you're no self, there's nobody here named Locke, there never was, it's just an illusion. But in this part space system, there's a ego function or an ego manager that's very important and that's been trying its hardest to help out and keep you safe. And so you start to relate to your, your, your body and your mind and your human personality as if it's part of the show, not the center anymore, but the not negated, not an either or. But so there's a similarity in this psychology to a non-dual experience that there is no bad parts, that the parts of you are trying, even the rageful parts and the judgmental parts are confused and trying to be, help you be safe. But as soon as you recognize them from what in IFS they call self with a capital S, self essence, self energy toward the parts, then you can unburden the parts from their confusion or their burden of trauma, the the more childlike parts or exiled parts that been hiding away, holding a shame-based view, I'm not good enough, I'm worthless. So those parts can be met by this true nature or self or awake consciousness, and then interconnected with in a way that they're not two, so that there's a, a liberation or a unburdening, or a feeling that, okay, I see you, I'm with you, it's okay. You don't have to feel like you're worthless. That's, that, you know, that's a, a view that you held since childhood, and now you can release that because you're now here and now. Right. I've found that in sharing your work, with people that your self-compassion meditations mm -hmm. really just allow people with traumas, people who are carrying, you know, uh, self-worth, uh, they have a lack of self-worth or shame or guilt. Mm -hmm. It really guides them to this space where they can meet these parts with real understanding and compassion and allow for healing and transformation to begin. Do you yeah. mind maybe walking us through a brief self-compassion glimpse? Sure. 
Yeah, and the interesting thing is just to distinguish it again as we're kind of distinguishing conventional mindfulness with effortless mindfulness as two versions of, of a similar kind of practice or continuum. And then same with what is traditionally called self-compassion, uh, which is, you know, feeling like there's a hurt part and then trying to be compassionate toward yourself as like a loving kindness right. or self-compassion. So really what this is, <laughs> is this is, uh, can you be aware of those two parts, <laughs> even the one trying to be compassionate from a dimension that's naturally loving? And that is who you are, and is kind of receiving, almost receiving support too from the universe or the the feeling of connected to something that is safe and grounded and loving. I really like the image of the hand on the back, which you've yeah. used at some of your retreats, but that bigger loving, awake, compassionate awareness that has all of our backs yes. supporting you. Yeah. So there, there are some, you know, some even, you know, in kind of doing effortless mindfulness, it, you know, we did a, a direct glimpse, but often the first stage is in uh, mindfulness is shamatha or calm abiding or peaceful abiding. And so it's important to find a way that works. For some, it's concentration or one point of attention. For right. others, it's kind of yogic breathing, three-part breath, or even neuroscience now they have called the box breathing. And that what that does is it calms right. the nervous system, takes you out of fight, flight, freeze. And that's really what we need is just for a period of time to do some kind of calming um, and then as soon as you're calm, you can go and upgrade to this awake consciousness or this unconditional loving presence so that you don't have to feel like you have to do three years of calming practice to go to the next level. You can do, once you learn how to do that and you feel calm, now you can. So, so there are hand gestures some people feel just by putting your hand on your heart space. Some people, you put it like holding the head of a baby, or you can, you know, kind of create some heat or some energy and do that. And we're not taking a lot of time now, but you'll feel how it's almost like a click when you do it just the right amount of time. You'll just, yeah. it's literally your nervous system will just go like that. And the other one is, is called a heart hug, which is putting your hand on the side of your heart and then almost like you're receiving and giving a hug from yourself. You're receiving it from the unconditionally loving self. And then you feel as if you have the support of awareness behind your back kind of coming in when you put your hand here or there. So those are just, again, kind of some simple glimpse style calming practices that are that the key is every one system is different and they can need to find what works for them you don't have to just do one tradition or you know but no learn what what is the principle that we're doing so shamatha is the first principle you know calm calming your mind calming your body you know soothing the animal <laughs> and then the second principle is yeah and everyone knows yeah. What that feels like when we're stressed out to try to accomplish a task first, when we're relaxed, laid back, open, responsive. Yeah. And like yeah. you said, it really is that transition from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight, too. Mm -hmm. Yes. And just to add to that, another modality for people with trauma that seems to be showing a lot of success is the EMDR. I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> yes. much with Yeah, yeah, I, I'm trained that modality, in EMDR, but... yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, that's that's very good for some people. Yeah, very, very immediate, kind of a glimpse style <laughs> practice because it, it it just takes a series of sessions. It's It's not something you need to be involved in for a long time, and it's not a real, 
you know, thought based. It's very body based system, right? right? EMDR. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So we can just kind of go through the that feeling of, um, you know, the the three systems of, you know, there's the the man the managers system, like the ego manager and the protective protectors that are like judge the judges and the scanners for danger and then firefighters right. which are ones who just act out very quickly because they've reached their limit and they've got to protect or you know fight right. and this these are the ones that come out um you know often in intimate relationships with when I do couples therapy the the protectors called firefighters will just start screaming <laughs> you know no what do you mean yeah. you're you know telling me to take out the garbage you know, I thought I, you know, thought I told you I'd do it late. You know, and and then if you can just calm the system, and recognize, okay, that is c protecting a little part of you that felt like when you were judged as a kid or yelled at as a kid, or and now you're you're acting it out as a way to protect the little kid, um, like a cat backed in a corner, right. And underneath, if you can follow it back and find, oh, this part that felt like nobody sees me, they don't care, I can never do it right. Uh, so if you feel that part, even just a, a little bit, and then find out where it is in your body. So either find, you can, you can actually start with either. So find a part that's judgmental or feels uh, blaming of someone else or yourself, which is one of the directions of the judge, right? Right. Like th those people, I can't believe they're, you know, they did this to me, or I can't believe I did this, or there's a part of you that feels hurt or not good enough or not smart, not lovable, not creative. Find it in your body. And then just ask that part for some space so you can know it better. And as you do, this is kind of the mindful move. So as soon as you ask for some space, you're, you're respecting the part, whether it's a judge or the exiled child part. Now just be aware of it. See how you feel toward it. And then ask that part that's witnessing for some space and then open to this ocean of awareness not from your head but from your open heart so you open out and come back into this open-hearted awake loving flow toward the mindful witness and toward either the judge or the shame-based part. And just be with that part just as it is without trying to change it. And just see if you can be curious about what it is like. See if that part can feel that you're here with it, that you're not trying to change it, that you're just letting it be the way it is. And you're noticing that it can take its time and that letting it know I'm here for you. And feel the quality of that unconditional love that's even different than compassion, that feels like there's no conditions. It's okay. And then just as you're aware of it receiving, see how you feel toward that part and whether that part can receive that, even a little bit, maybe not completely because it's still defended. And then just feel what is the unconditional love like? What is it like to be unconditional love toward any part, toward your body, toward this part? And then just let yourself Again, come back to that one part, but then your body, 
And just for the short practice, we're, we're not completely unburdening that part. We're just actually feeling what it's like to be unconditionally loving, even for a, a glimpse. How do you feel toward imperfect? How do you feel toward judge, judging if it's really trying to protect you? How do you feel toward a young part that felt like it wasn't good enough? And then the key is how do you feel as unconditional loving that's not separate from whatever arises? So, what do you notice? Hmm. An ease, uh, an acceptance, a yeah, spaciousness, uh, kind of all embracing welcomeness. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Powerful. As I told you off the mic, I've had some of my childhood traumas resurfaced recently. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that uh, really opened up some space for me and allowed me to tap into some just unconditional goodness and love. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah, beautiful. And just to say for those, you know, for those who were, this was new or felt like I was going a little fast, you can, you know, listen to this again or listen to, you know, a glimpse that I do in other places like my app that you can go and let and guide be guided through with one particular part of you one at a time in a more slow structured way but you can see the effect from somebody who has done this before um as you listen to john yeah um truly one of the most healing practices in my repertoire. Mm. Um, like I said at the beginning of the podcast, Locke is my love warrior when I'm in mm. need of some of that unconditional love. He is at the top of the list. So yeah, please check out his app and mm. uh, his books are tremendous as well. But okay, so something else I want to discuss is at the most re recent retreat I attended at Omega in New York, you handed out a questionnaire, the Pain Key Richards questionnaire. Mm -hmm. It's used at John Hopkins for post psilocybin treatment. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, do you want to kind of speak to the types of questions on this questionnaire? Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. So, <laughs> you know, as John says, it's interesting that in some ways, the effortless mindfulness approach, sometimes it goes in first, we drop from head to heart, which is another type of glimpse. But the way we did it, you know, what's here now when there's no problem to solve, it's as if we're going more spacious and more disembodied in order to come back subtly to being embodied and then finding love. So it, it's fascinating that we're not trying, we don't start by trying to be loving or trying to, you know, imagine loving kindness or compassion, that we literally step out of all conditioning into this foundation of okayness and this ground of intelligent spacious awareness rather than intelligent thought-based positive thinking or negative thinking we we literally unhook from conditioning into the foundation of pure awareness that then arises with the same taste as aliveness and then interconnects in a way that reveals that the foundation is unconditional love or what's called bodhicitta or or awake loving flow. So, you know, interestingly, many people who have been practicing meditation or have had uh, difficulty with mental health 
areas, severe chronic depression, or just those who are exploring how to how do I get out of this existential anxiety, which is really the core of suffering right. from this consciousness or Buddhist is something's wrong. So the, the Buddhist word for suffering is dukkha, and it's often translated as perpetual dissatisfaction. So it's not about just regular suffering pain. It's about, okay, whether I'm happy or whether everything's going right or something's not quite right. And what that is, is, is a case of mistaken identity. In other words, it's trying to operate from that small self that's always scanning for danger, looking for a problem to solve, and projecting worst case scenarios into the future, and not accessing this already unconditionally loving presence that we are. So it's hiding it. So many people have sought through uh, psychedelics to try to heal the brain that gets tight because it's trying to defend. And those who have in uh, clinical settings like Johns Hopkins, they developed a scale of originally was longer, but now it's 30 questions. And they give it to people after a therapeutic uh, session that's monitored and, and worked with by therapists. Some of the groups are people with depression, others are people in end stage cancer. And th these questions that cor correspond to how people get relieved of the suffering through uh, psilocybin in this case. And what they talk about often is what's called ego dissolution, and then parachuting into this sense of an interconnected sense of well-being, which is kind of what we're unconditional love. Everything's okay, and things will, you know, guilt and shame will move through the field as visual and memory. And but they've acts if they can access these qualities of this true nature, they can be with and actually there, you know, are qualities of the brain kind of re. Uh, structuring to a kind of holistic uh, interco new interconnection. So these questions are, what are the qualities that show up when you access this? And so the qualities are similar to these words we've been using. So um, you did you experience a, a sense of interconnectedness on a scale of one to five? Did you experience a sense of non-fear, non-worry, and non-shame, a sense of uh, pure awareness. Did you experience a, and then you, you rate yourself, did you experience a sense of awe or sacredness? And so these, these signs of markers of going beyond the ego, the ego dissolution, but then not just no self, but finding the true nature or the true self or authentic self or um, holistic self. Interbeing. Interbeing is what Thich Nhat Hanh called it. So there's really no word and it's not exactly a self or it's not exactly a, but it right. feels like something greater that is okay. And, you know, do, do you experience a yeah. sense of well-being? Completion. Completion. Yeah. yeah. So, so this, this so I gave this out because I found that in a retreat with no no substances, but just going through this series of glimpses, uh, I gave this out. I'm saying, I wonder if these if this group of people during this weekend retreat, Friday to Sunday, uh, where where they rank. And so the results of about uh, ninety people was that they averaged four point five out of five which is significantly higher than the, the top groups of uh, psilocybin positive experiences. Yeah, so wow. all that is to say is that there is a way to access similar experiences. And certainly for those who are either therapeutically or use, have used, these are practices that can be done uh, micro meditations rather than micro dosing every day. 
<laughs> right, without the pyrotechnics of psychedelics right. or without the pyrotechnics. So that's the more that stable. Action, yes. Yes. So you could say, yeah. So so the thing that's different is you don't because half of the practices are eyes open. So you don't get the trails, you don't get the and when you go inside and things start moving, they're immediately moving within the awake consciousness rather than going through what 40% of people who take psychedelics go through the hell realm because they're still in the ego. And as things start flooding, they're fighting it and they can't let go and they're they're right. getting dragged down and dragged under or flooded by the unconscious. So this way we introduce the spacious, pervasive, unconditionally loving presence. And then if parts come up or unconscious comes up, it's it's seen and almost titrated by the intelligence of the um, awake consciousness about how much can come up during a meditation. Whereas when you take a substance, you you're just you've given over all, you know, all control of what is more visual and more externally visual and internally, depending on the yeah. medicine. Right. You know, you shared these results with me, and I wasn't surprised. You know, I have a long history with psychedelics and entheogens, and I there's two concerns I have with the current trend towards psychedelics. And one of them is this desire to continually seek peak experiences, mm -hmm. which is, you know, truly in the end, the uh, opposite of mm -hmm. the spiritual journey, which is more and more letting go, letting be. And so, yeah, people get caught in cycle of wanting and seeking, and mm -hmm. this creates just more dukkha, unsatisfactoriness. Mm -hmm. And... The second concern I I have is as this uh, new trend kind of explodes, we have ketamine clinics opening, we have lots of guides, I say guides in air quotes, in even in the states where some of these substances are illegal still, they offer these substances, these medicines, these drugs, without any kind of framework to hold the experience or to guide you or navigate you. And like you said, a lot of people will experience the dissolution of self and then they get flooded with subconscious visions, traumas, fears, and there's nothing to do with them. There's no mm -hmm. support. And so, yeah, a lot of people walk away from these experiences no better off. Um, so, yeah, recently I had my cousin, he's a professional a lawyer, works in the tech world, uh, Silicon Valley, and he had a friend that recently opened a ketamine clinic and mm. so he went ahead and tried it out and turns out the owner of this clinic his friend has actually never tried the substance himself wow. now his reasoning was i don't want to be a doctor that is, gets high on my own medicine it's like oh okay I, there is something there's a kernel of truth to that but without understanding the experiential process, how can you really guide your patients? Or mm -hmm. anyway, so my cousin, he goes in, he gets hooked up, he gets this ketamine treatment, and then they kind of come in at the tail end and rush him out. Uh, it's like, okay, get in your car, drive home. Uh, and he's just stuck with this what just happened, you know? So, yeah, in general, I feel like we as a culture need to kind of pump the brakes 
mm-hmm. slow down a little bit. You know, I don't want, uh, there's, of course, I feel tremendous value to different drugs like MDMA in a therapeutic setting and uh, psilocybin with these existential concerns with cancer patients. and But yes, more and more, I am shying away from psychedelics and entheogens Mm -hmm. and trying to orient people to this more sustainable approach, which, you know, these non-dual glimpses that you're offering really Mm -hmm. provide. And, you know, yes, someone can take three to five grams of psilocybin and they will realize there's something there. There's no question. Mm -hmm. And someone may sit and do uh, some kind of guided meditation for 10 minutes. Maybe they do that for a week, for a month, and they don't get anything out of it. So Mm -hmm. yes, I see pros as well. And for me personally, psychedelics certainly open me up to the spiritual realm. You know, I was kind of the staunch atheist, the critic. Mm -hmm. And after taking psychedelics, I realized, oh, you know what, there is, there's this whole realm here that I was totally unaware of and ignorant Mm -hmm. of. So anyway, yeah, again, back to your results. I, I'm not surprised. Uh, And again, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, you really are an architect of mind. Uh, I've shared your meditations with many people. I haven't come across someone who there was no impact, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, and yeah, it may not be this Mm mind-blowing experience at first, but it will definitely soften the heart, open Mm -hmm. the heart. And over time, you know, you get one glimpse and sure, maybe it's only a brief second, a moment, but then you do it again and again. And over time, these glimpses start to become a more habitual way of moving through the world and orienting. Mm-hmm. But I, I don't know if you want to respond to any of that. Yeah, no, I, I tend to agree with <clears throat> with you and your hesitancy and evaluation. And yet <clears throat> I also recognize it's become such a trend <laughs> that why not give the map? So in some ways, the effortless mindfulness approach and the mindful glimpses give a map and some pre sense. And they're also a tremendous way of integrating if people do decide to uh, try psychedelics, which, as you said, as Ram Das famously said, who was a researcher and and then a meditator, uh, that psychedelics are a good window, but not a great door. Right. So they can open you up and then, but having a daily practice or an orientation to what is this true nature, how does it relate to my emotions and the unconscious material that came up quickly now it's still it didn't it didn't clear through it's going to come up again slowly now how do i respond to it and who am i so the best of psychedelic experience and the best of non-dual you know embodied practice is you recognize who you are and you recognize that the primary dimension of your consciousness and the universal consciousness are not different and that you have this new ground of wellness and wholeness that can be with any emotional condition that shakes you uh, because the capacity is now so big yeah. and so loving. So as soon as you find the... Right. So that's the, that's the thing that it can show you which this also the glimpse practices show you that that the essential well-being or that's that is 
a vast capacity of of loving presence that's with the uh, repressed contents and traumas of childhood and and the mental attempt to try to figure it all out and keep in control. You see those parts are like, well, thank you for trying to to analyze everything and 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 figure out how do I how am I going right. to do it right? How am I going to do it right? If I don't do it right, everything is going to fall apart. It's like, okay, thank you, sweetheart. It's you know, you're I see you now, <laughs> and we're not going to judge you for that. We're not going to say you don't exist. Yeah. I just see that you've been tr you're so exhausted. Could you please semi retire and just relax from trying to be the the driver of the vehicle right. and let yourself play a little bit right. and find the I'm not the trying to extinguish you like right. I, I want you yeah That's and it. it's not you, you you don't need to go away it's that semi retire no. you know you're yes. still valuable i still see your worth and yeah we're, we're a team i just you can relax a little bit and know that you know this loving awareness supports you yeah that's right let me just say i i know several of you of course are still going to dabble with psychedelics and entheogens and mm -hmm. if you do i highly suggest that you pair that experience with a some kind of meditation framework so not long ago river my partner and i did a ketamine session and we actually went through 10 to 12 of Locke's glimpses throughout that session mm -hmm. before, during, and after. And my partner, she said, so the words that came to her during and after that experience were safety, security, vastness, compassion, and with one of Locke's self-compassion glimpses, it allowed her to really connect fully with her body mm. and then not only to stop there, but to transcend her body and realize that, you know, I am so much more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, just throw in some caution, please, you know. Hmm. treat them ceremonially, bring in some wisdom traditions to help guide the experience. In uh, any case, yeah, be, be responsible. Yeah. Now, another thing I wanted to bring up, you keep mentioning maps. Yeah. And I find this, your map, I believe you have five or six kind of mm -hmm. locations that I find very useful just navigating daily life. It's, oh, okay, we know this is here and I know how to get to this place. So maybe for another brief meditation, do you kind of want to walk us through your map? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, you know, we've talked a little about it. So a map is just a way to try to give what are called orientation instructions, <laughs> uh, how to shift your consciousness and how to navigate so that when you let go, you start to realize, okay, what's letting go, who's letting go, and where is it letting go into? And then once I've let go, <laughs> where, where am I and who am I now that, and what's the relationship to my everyday consciousness. So all that to say that, you know, the simple map is that our conventional way of organizing is usually called everyday mind. So everyday mind and consciousness is, oh, it's me, I'm here, I've got to get up and do this work. And, and we're kind of located in our head looking out of our eyes. Right. And then the next location is subtle mind, which is a mindful witness. So this is what a lot of mindfulness is about. You calm the everyday mind and body, and then you shift up into a meditator consciousness or subtle mind, which is a, or you drop into subtle body by doing practices like doing yoga, 
saying om. We go into out of your everyday mind into subtle body, qigong, exercise, dance. So you're dropping out of the self into a physical subtle body or you step up as many people do in vipassana into subtle mind. So that's second location. And that's where most people will work. And once you step into this subtle second subtle mind, you can start to see that in the everyday mind body is these parts and thoughts, feelings, sensations, emotions. You can see them as changing contents and as constellations of consciousness. So that's most of where most meditation and psychology is. Right. So the third location is awake awareness, which is the the new. So instead of awareness looking at the contents of thoughts, feelings, sensations, worry, anxiety, feelings, awareness turns back and looks back through the lens until it finds the subtlest dimension of awareness that's already awake and aware by itself. So that's what we did when we did what's here now when there's no problem to solve. Right. So the everyday mind and the subtle mind, the subtle mind is still dancing here, but we've gone subtler than the subtle mind into the pure awareness dimension. And then when pure awareness and the aliveness are same taste or non-dual, that's called simultaneous mind or presence or non-dual embodiment or interconnectedness or interbeing, as, as Thich Nhat Hanh called it, interbeing, which is interbeing here, but it's also interconnected with everyone and everything. And so that's the quality that River described as kind of the safety. Right. That's where you feel safe. Like you're not safe by scanning in your mind from everyday mind. You're actually like, oh, the awareness is primary, but I'm not disembodied, but I'm transcendent and <laughs> included. And, and then there's the, the heart mind is the fifth heart mind or open-hearted awareness or awake loving flow where you start, you've dropped from head to heart space and you feel like you're interconnected and you still have this wisdom mind that can use thought and, and emotion and you're operating more from a, a flow, a wisdom flow, uh, but it has this support of love. And so that's the fifth. And so, so almost each full glimpse will take you through you know, just because they're all there, it's like using a microscope. You could, you know, use a set of glasses and you see everything. Then you use a microscope and you can see thoughts, feelings, sensations. And then you use an electron microscope and you'll see space, mostly space. Then you use a right. telescope and you see mostly universe. And then you feel this universal consciousness that you're now aware of and as and from. And so that that then opens you up yeah, this, to this beingness. To, to beingness. And beingness, because it's not separate and not threatened, has a natural love. It has natural safety and a natural love. And 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 these a taste of this, that's why a glimpse, we do glimpses of this, because sometimes it just needs like what's called recognition or f and then familiarization like oh right that's me huh and then everything will relax and then you may lose it and get back in the everyday mind will take over but you kind of can you learn to return during the day and then it becomes like a developmental stage over time right it becomes more primary more sense of who i am you know, so so there are ways to do it slowly, but if you just almost assume that I'm talking to you, uh, and when I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you, the already awake consciousness, because that's the premise, is that we're already awake. There's an awakeness. It's covered up. It's in the background. So if your awakeness is identified with this everyday mind, and the awakeness or the awareness can can move itself and unhook and drop, 
Just feel that awareness decenter. Ah, and move down so you're aware of your smile and your jaw from within your jaw. And then that kind of globe of direct perception can feel your throat and your neck from within. So you don't have to check back up to thought and you don't have to stretch attention down, but you can feel as if you're aware of the effervescent aliveness, the physicalness, the space, and the awareness within your throat directly. And then simply let your awareness drop below your neck to feel your body directly from within. So what does that feel like to be embodied for the first time? And you can feel your whole body all at once. And then feel as if your awareness looks for this open space, this heart space, somewhere in the middle of your body. And then goes like a living stream and then subtler into the atom, into the space of open-heartedness, what you know of as being aware not from your head, but your heart. Not your emotional heart, but this deep, boundless heart. And notice the boundless heart is not only within, but it's all around. So it's also within you and behind you. And let that awareness move at the speed of awareness until it finds the awake field of awareness, the ocean of awareness that's already awake without your help. And as it mingles, feel the receiving of that ocean of awareness as it arises as your whole body, this field of dancing aliveness, and looks out of the eyes of your heart. So as if your eyes are receiving, and then you're feeling interconnected with everyone and everything. As you feel back to the support, feel embodied interbeing within, and then feel this compassion toward everyone and everything. May all beings be well and happy. May they find the awareness behind their back. And may I learn to return home, home sweet home, in this heart mind, which is wise and loving and rest, resting as safety, able to respond when needed, welcoming of all parts and emotions, able to respond rather than react. Just notice, is this a meditation state that comes and goes, or could this be a returning home to who we actually are, to which other states can now come and go? Is this the true you? Could this be? If it is, would you want to return and learn to live from here? Would that be your heart's desire? Mm. Well, thank you, Locke. I yeah. think that is a wonderful place to leave it. Yes. I really appreciate the work you're doing. If I can ever support you, please let me know how. Yeah. Is there any place you would like to, if my listeners are interested, any place to send them? Sure. Of course, the app is available on the App Store. and Yeah. uh, I mentioned the two books, but yeah, where can they go to learn more about you? Yeah, so probably the easiest place is the website, which is just my name. It's a, actually, we have a 5013C nonprofit called Effortless Mindfulness Institute, but it's the website's lockkelly.org, L-O-C-H-K-E-L-L-Y.org, and you'll see the Mindful Glimpses app 
uh, available, which is basically just a kind of a whole intro course of glimpses, all short and then daily glimpses. That new one will come up every day, so it'll kind of start to give you this framework and this map, but through direct experience. So thank you so much, John, for your kindness and your real authenticity. You're just a, a tremendous being, and I always enjoy spending time with you. Mm. Thank you, Locke. All right, take care. Give, give right. Paige my best. I will. Thank you so much. Give Rivermine.